And welcome everybody once again ladies and gentlemen androids and reptiles we are here uh, with episode 28 of the cult of copy show yay um this uh week's episode is a continuation of our discussions about uh using cognitive biases logical fallacies and uh heuristic errors to uh trick people into doing what we want uh particularly uh for the purposes of the cult of copy we do this for marketing um i like to make it sound sinister and spooky but uh really we are generally good people if you're new to the cult of copy uh i am your host my friend dr sir colin d terrio uh we are uh the cult of copy that is is uh, a discussion group as of now fifteen thousand members on facebook we also have a website at cultofcopy.com that I promise I will start posting to more regularly. And uh, we also have this here YouTube channel where you can watch the previous 27 episodes of this lovely show. That's at youtube.com slash cultofcopy. That's it for my spiel about branding and who we are, but we're going to jump right into today's content. So last week we talked about did, uh, the confirmation bias, and then last week we did anchoring anchoring that's right and uh this week like i said we're going to talk about the bandwagon effect now the bandwagon effect is for those of you that don't know the concept that the more people that are doing a certain thing or believe a certain thing the more likely a new person is to adopt that behavior or action without considering any other reason than it must be the thing to do because so many other people are doing it right so it's like the peer pressure thing your mom says you know if all your friends jumped off a bridge would you usually the answer is yes most of the time um, unless you're given a good reason not to or it's you know really adamantly against your convictions most of the time people are willing to let sort of the hive mind make decisions for them and the reason for that is biologically speaking it's it's difficult to put in the research and thought and analysis to come up with a really informed opinion or make an informed decision about something, right? Like it, you just, if you can get out of doing that work and just have someone do the decision or make their opinion for you and you feel like it's one that fits pretty well with what you already believe, you're just gonna go ahead and adopt what the crowd thinks, right? And the reason for that is like your, your brain, believe it or not, biologically without asking you tries to work as little as possible and wants shortcuts as much as it can because it likes to rest because its whole goal is just to keep you alive so biologically speaking a lot of the coding and programming in your brain is still thinking that like a tiger is going to jump out of the bushes at any minute so it tries to do as little work as possible to keep itself freed up for that important stuff avoiding tigers finding bananas and finding something to hump is really what your brain wants to spend the majority of its time on. So this bandwagon effect, I, like in modern times, I don't want it to, I don't want to give the impression that it's strictly like a monkey see monkey do kind of thing. Cause like I said, it, it won't work if, if whatever we're talking about is something that is just totally against your values, totally against your ethics. But generally speaking, if, the group of people that we're talking about is someone that you see as being like you or a group that you want to consider getting over a cough. Um, if the group in question is like you or uh, is a group that you want to be seen as being a part of, it's much more influential to you. So um, the way I've taught it before is uh, one person might be crazy two people might be codependent, but if three people are into it, they might be onto something. Um, and obviously the, the effect, at least as shown in lab studies, the bandwagon effect is proportional. So like the more people are on the bandwagon, the more it affects your opinion on whether that's a good idea to do, you know, like the bigger and bigger the crowd gets, the more influence it has over your decision-making process. A few experiments, if like you want to dig a little deeper into this and, uh, you know, look up some stuff. Solomon Ash probably did the most famous compliance uh, experiments uh, using the bandwagon effect. And what it was from the, the 
the experimental subject's point of view. They were brought into a room and they were shown things like a card that had A, B, C, and D, and under each letter was a line of a certain length. And they were asked to identify which line was longer, right? Seems pretty easy. Like if you got eyes that work, you can tell which line is longer. And there were other people in the room. And what would happen is the experimenter would come back in to see what answer the group arrived at. And the other people without the experimental subject knowing it, the other people that seemed to be also part of the experiment were actually confederates. And they would lie and say, no, we think C was the longest one. And the person knows that it was D, but they go with what the crowd says more and more. The bigger the crowd is saying that it's C, the more likely the person is to change their answer to, again, something they actually know is incorrect. The urge to not go against what the group is saying is so strong, people will just doubt their own mind in order to do with what go with what the crowd's doing. And there have been various theories about why this is. A lot of it has to do with social acceptance. We don't want to go against the group because even though it's some arbitrary group, like a random bunch of strangers you're conducting an experiment with, you don't want to be rejected from the group that you're a part of. It's just a very strong, almost subconscious, but very powerfully active um, sort of urge to not go against the group. Um, so I guess what we're really here today to talk about, now that you know what the bandwagon effect is and things you can look up about it if you're so inclined we're going to just going to dive into the practical side of it because that's what i care about how can you use the bandwagon effect to build your business and build your profits within that business so obviously the first way is to show off your crowd show off the size of your audience if you notice at the beginning of this and frequently at the beginning of any episode of this show i will mention to you the ever increasing number of people inside the cult of copy group sometimes i'll even tell you that we have people literally represented in almost every country on earth, certainly on all seven continents and every U S state and all her territories. I'll say things like that because I'm trying to show off the size of my crowd. When you go to the, the group on Facebook, it tells you that we have over 15,000 members. It shows how many are there. And I leverage that fact all the time because it makes the group seem cool to people who have never heard of it. There must be something to it. If 15,000 people are in it now, I'll tell you a little secret. You should probably realize this. Many of those people are not active in the group. You know, the group's been running for three years. People join things. They forget about it. They don't ever leave. There's no reason to. Maybe they just passively lurk and read stuff. I have no way of knowing. Really, the core active group at any given time in there is maybe 100 people of, you know, active posters who read every day and interact and leave comments and things. But that 15,000 number is super impressive. That's what gets people to join. Um, and that's why I do that. Other ways you can show off the crowd, um, businesses that have a physical location. Um, a lot of times there's like, for example, there's a reason movie theaters put the box office outside. It's not just to save room inside the building in all cases, because you'll notice like, like movie theaters are usually huge nowadays, right? Lots of empty space. Maybe they were smaller back in the day or like theaters were smaller. So I'm sure at some point it was a space saving concern. But nowadays, the reason they put the movie line outside is because a huge line of people waiting to get in a movie is an attractor for people just walking by, not having anything to do. They're like, ah, I should go to the movies. There must be something good. Look how long the line is. Um, it's the same thing with... Uh, uh, like food courts in the mall, they're specifically designed to make it so that you can see which lines are long because that's like the food that's in demand. Um, being able to show that a crowd has gathered around something is always an attractor. Um, lots of times, uh, even, even for like demonstrations of products, like the guerrilla marketing style, like uh, during the holidays, you'll see people with like, table set up in department stores where they're showing off some particular product that they happen to be selling right there. Um, the idea there is you want a crowd to gather. So a lot of times they'll have a confederate pretend to be a shopper who is interested. And that's what sort of seeds the snowball effect of people showing up and gathering around and people see a crowd. 
they want to see what the crowd's interested in. That at least, even if they're they end up not being interested in it, the fact that a crowd is interested in it is something that people want to check out. So that's the easiest way you can use the bandwagon effect. Um, <clears throat> also, by the way, uh, I, I didn't mention it. Uh, Zane, our director, is watching the chat box and the comments. So if you have a question about what we're talking about on the show, let Zane know and he will interrupt me. Don't feel like you're going to mess up my flow. I do like getting questions. That's the whole reason we do the show live. So if you are watching the show live, please do interrupt with a question. I would love to answer it. Um, the next way you can leverage the bandwagon effect is if you are doing something like a product launch or a release of a piece of content, you want to talk about or create it first, deliberately engineer it, but then talk about uh, an exponential buzz. So if there is a sort of like, well, one person talked about it and then two people shared it, and then now it's been posted on like four blogs, that's something you want to show off when you do your own promotions because the the speed at which people are getting into the crowd and jumping onto something is also something that, that people are attracted to. Um, that sort of has to do with the idea of being like hip and cool and being an early adopter, being in before everybody likes it. Um, people also like to just be involved in things that are like trending within their little various worlds they like to be involved in. So you see this a lot in the music industry and uh, film or TV where they try and tap into um, the fact that like the show premiered strong and then had like double the audience in the second week. They usually try and talk not just about how many people are viewing, but you want to give the impression that like it's more and more and it's compounding over time. Um, that's something that you can utilize in a ton of different ways. Uh, even like if you, if you sell a piece of software and your user base is growing exponentially, that's a factor that you want to share, not just how many people are in it, <coughs> excuse me, but the rate at which it is growing is something that appeals to people. Cool. Um, Tom Lambert's asking, how can you use the bandwagon effect in a sales letter or a video sales letter? It's funny you ask that because uh, not so much in a video sales letter, but in a print sales letter, um, the first company that I worked for as a copywriter, um, our sales letter had essentially a wall of testimonials, right? Now, what they had done was they had something like, like the product was an info product that collected lots of material that had been produced over the previous years for like one-on-one -on -one clients. And of those one-on-one -on -one clients, they had like, like 50 of them, let's say. Now, every single one of those, they got badgered into doing, I'm, I say badgered, like they were happy to do it because they were super, super happy with the results. But they got badgered into doing a video testimonial, which we then transcribed, and then we posted in full. So on the day of launch of this expensive, I think it was $800 a month or like 10 grand for a year, paid up front, something like that. Um, what it was is there were like 47 full length video testimonial case study things with, you know, full transcripts that you could read. And what we did is we put the very best ones at the top, like as the first top five. And then the second best ones were at the bottom as like the bottom five. And then all the rest kind of fell in the middle. The idea being we wanted to do the bandwagon effect in that sales letter where you're like, you know what, there's just like I read the first two. They were amazing. I scrolled to the bottom. The very last one was still amazing. There's like 50 of them. I'm not spending eight hours watching all of these video testimonials and case studies. I get it. This must be legit because there's like 50 of them, right? So that wall of testimonials effect can have a bandwagon effect when you just keep collecting them, when you put them all in one place. So it's not just your very best ones that are cherry picked. You know, those are always good, but when you have this, this undeniable mass of them all piled up, it does have that bandwagon effect. So that's definitely a way you can use it sort of with video and in a sales letter. Now, I wouldn't say to put a big giant 
series of video testimonials in the middle of a video sales letter. But if you get to the end of the video where you're done with your pitch and the buy button is there and you have like some more information for them to keep reading in the page, if you want to slap a long reel of testimonials that are people hitting those positive points one after the other again and again, you know, do it. Like after the pitch is done, just let that video keep going with more and more and more testimonials <clears throat> while the, uh, the audience is still there. Because if they haven't left, they haven't bought they're still on the fence and all of those the cumulative effect is going to happen the more <coughs> excuse me the more and more you expose them to those messages so that's a way to use sort of the line around the building as like in written form you know like you can't actually show a physical line of people who bought a digital product but you can stack up their testimonials and let that work as a stand in for their physical body and say, okay, well, like this giant pile of testimony is, you know, uh, attributed to that. Another thing is very subtle. I think I, we even talked about this last week. When you uh, post a picture of yourself in your sales letter to sort of set up your authority at the beginning, if you have a picture of you speaking on stage in front of a crowd, that influences people because the crowd alters mm -hmm. the way that they see you when you have a crowd built up around you that changes the way people recognize things. And even for things like YouTube videos, like like think of how it's bragging rights, how it, it, it somehow makes a video better that tons and tons of people have watched it, right? Um, the idea that a bunch of people watched it and, in, and the thing of it is, when it comes to YouTube, you have no idea if they liked it or not. Like 10 million views doesn't mean it's a good video necessarily. But it just means a bunch of people watched it for whatever reason. But the idea is, well, if a bunch of people watched it, there must be something of value in it. The thing is, if you watched it and you think it sucks, you can't take back your viewer number, right? Like the turnstile has been turned. So you can't say, oh, I wasted my time watching this. I'm taking it back so that videos that are crappy look like not a lot of people have watched them. It doesn't work that way. So the turnstile number you know, this many people have been through this turnstile, that has value too. Um, okay. Ho hopefully that helps and answers yeah, we, the question. We've got a follow-up from Tom and then another question uh, from, from Nutri Supreme. So I'll, I'll throw down both questions and you can just <laughs> <All right. laughs> answer. But, uh, let's ask them one at a time so I don't forget. What, okay. All right. What, so, well, Tom, Tom is basically the, the follow-up question. He's saying, uh, what if you don't have a massive audience? Does a can you still do some kind of bandwagon effect? You can. What you do is you do that exponential buzz thing and you use it to sort of seed the growth, right? So if you're actively trying to build an audience, it's going to start to build up exponentially, especially if you find just a few people who really like your thing, really push them, really encourage them to go share it and get the message out there and then start talking about that how that exponential buzz is happening. So like for the Cult of Copy group, when it first started, like you can find old recordings of me giving talks at conferences or whatever, even on older iterations of the show. The group's only three years old. So like we went from like a few hundred people. I think the first talk I gave about the group, we, we weren't even at a thousand maybe in the first year. And then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And what happens is you're taking advantage of not the size of the crowd, but the fact that the crowd is increasing. Because if you remember what I said, the experiments have proven that, that the, it's a, a proportional sort of relationship. So the more and more the crowd grows, the more and more that influences someone to make a decision based on the size of the crowd. So if you can show to people that over time, the crowd is getting bigger and bigger, that becomes an influencing factor because they're the way their mind works they're like okay well it's an upward curve and it's just going to keep growing i may as well jump in on it now because eventually it will be a huge crowd at least that's sort of the conclusion people tend to make unless they have a reason to think that that wouldn't be true um but like i said most of the time people are their brains are too lazy to allow them to sit there and think about it when it can just say well look a bunch of people already like it let's just check it out right so that's one way you can do it if you don't already have an existing audience and leverage this effect 
to keep compounding and growing the audience more and more. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I appreciate it. So the um, do, do you want to talk about some more uh, some more stuff that you had planned, or do you want to answer Nutri's question? Yeah, let's answer the next question. Okay. Why not? So Nutri Supreme uh, asks uh, in relation to the uh, the sales copy you were talking about. I uh, was wondering, do people still read long form copy, or does like a nice infographic work better? I mean, it depends on your audience. People, it, the internet is weird in that. When you say, oh, well, well, this doesn't work, like people don't read long form sales letters. Well, the, the people who do read long form sales letters read long form sales letters. And if one is there, they're going to read it. Is your, does your audience comprise of that? Do you have an audience that you've built to sort of expect that and want it? It just depends. It really depends. And, and as long as you sort of, I guess, give people options to sort of consume your stuff in the way they prefer. Um, you can build an audience out of like whoever, you know, uh, I've had success with long form sales letters. I've had success with shorter videos. I have success just doing social posts. Uh, this show helps grow my audience. I'm going to turn the show into a podcast. I started a blog. All of these things are just, I'm, I'm coming up with different ways to take the same content and put it in different formats so people can decide which one they like the best. Because I don't care if you read my ideas in an email or a blog or you read it on Facebook in the group or you watch the videos. I would love it if you, you watch as many of them and, and read as many of them as you want in whatever format you want. I'm not going to dictate to you which way something should work best, right? I'm going to try and get as many different kinds of, of mediums that can work for me. And, and I would love to use, I like reading infographics, so I can only presume other people do. They're popular. So I'm pretty sure if I took some of my content and made infographics about it, people would like that and probably share them. Um, I started doing uh, recently little quotes to start discussions, like pulling historical quotes from different people to start conversations about persuasion and influence in the group. And I deliberately am making those images, those little quote images, little square things. I'm using a social app that people use to put those things on uh, Instagram with a little, you know, square format to share pictures. I haven't told anybody to go share them on Instagram. Maybe I'll start a cult of copy Instagram and I'll start putting them there. I, it's just, you know, your audience, the individual audience member is going to have a preference, but the way the internet is like, there's no one audience that's like, oh, my buyers won't read long form sales letters. Like someone who wants to buy your product would watch your little short video and be like, I just wish I could read all this information off of something I can print out. Somebody out there who wants to give you money, wishes you had a long sales letter. When you have the time, put it all together, like more and more people will buy your stuff the more ways that you give them to consume your information. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's a, a good answer uh, for what you were asking. Yeah, that, that was it so far. So thanks Sweet. for the questions, everybody. Keep them coming. Awesome. So we talked about the wall of testimonials already. So a question led to that. That was something I was already going to talk about. Um, the next uh, way I can think of that you can leverage um, – the bandwagon effect in your business is if you have a product and you're doing something like a pre-launch or an internal launch to sort of, you know, test out your marketing material, see how your audience responds before you open it wide. Um, you can use things like that to create this buzz and this bandwagon effect before you do your full launch. So if you have something like, like a pre-order system, where people can pre-purchase something that you haven't released yet, but you are imminently releasing. Uh, you should definitely not release something, not sell, pre-sell anything you're not releasing. I think it's within 30 days is uh, the law, <laughs> depending on where you live. So that's something you should look into, by the way. Don't, don't pre-sell things that are way far out because um, you can get in trouble for that <clears throat> unless you're like a Kickstarter or something. I don't know how they, they get around it. Um, so doing pre-orders from like advertising the amount of pre-orders you have, that's basically how the entire book industry works. 
is pre-orders determine how many copies they're going to publish and whether they feel like it's going to be a bestseller. That's why when a book comes out, like on the very first day, they can tell you it's a bestseller. That doesn't mean like a bunch of people showed up at the bookstore that day to buy that book. It's based on pre-orders and projections. Um, so pre-orders are numbers you can use, uh, like in the software world and the gaming world, they do, um, you know, like beta, how many people were involved in the beta is something that they use in the marketing materials when the game is going to be released or, you know, the software is going to be released and say, you know, we had 10,000 testers working on this to make sure it was awesome. That appeals to people that creates a buzz because they're like that many people wanted to play this game or use this piece of software before it was even released. Um, so that's one way you can do it where you're, you're basically inventing or developing or engineering a sizable crowd of some kind before you actually release the product so that you can use that crowd and point to it and say, this big bunch of people already like this thing right when you actually do launch it and release it. So that's one way. Um, and then the last way I have to talk about, so hopefully I'm going to check the time. Man, I'm getting good at this, yeah. hitting the half hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the last one we're going to talk about is uh, particular to the little info marketing world that I come from. And uh, a lot of times you'll see affiliate uh, launches, like where somebody has an info product launch and they have a bunch of uh, joint venture partners and affiliates who are promoting it during the launch. They will show you these lists of the rankings of the various affiliates. <clears throat> And what that actually does is acts as an enticement for more people to want to get in and promote that affiliate offer because it looks like it's doing really well and a ton of people are promoting it and being successful with it. So if you're in that world, that affiliate marketing world, and you've ever seen these, they call them leaderboards. Um, part of the reason for sharing that, like I'm, I'm sure a lot of people that do it are just doing it because it's how they were taught to do it by some marketer at some point. But the whole reason the first guy who thought of doing that did it is because it shows you, look, this is legit. A bunch of affiliates are promoting it. There's like 40 of them on this list. And that's just where we cut it off. That means it's, you know, it's a popular product and a lot of people are promoting it. Therefore I better jump in if I'm an affiliate and I want to start promoting this product and, and get my own piece of that pie. I know a lot of marketers who think, oh, well, if I show people that they aren't like affiliates, aren't going to want to promote it because so many other people are already promoting it. That's just backwards. That's not how the herd mind works. Like we said, it's, uh, the, the, it's, it's uh, proportionally related. So the, the more people are doing a thing, the less people care about other pieces of information other than how many people are already doing it. The, the, the size of the crowd almost lets people have this super simple shortcut in their brain where they're like, surely, you know, like if there's a million people doing this thing, surely there are enough people like me to have done their homework and realized this was a good thing before doing it. So therefore I don't even have to think about it. Like now that that's not a conscious thought process that people think about when they get there, it just happens. Like your brain jumps to that conclusion and says, well, it must be safe. It must be cool or else not all of these people would be doing it. So you'll probably like it too. You should just go ahead and do it, monkey man. And you're like, okay, thanks brain, but not even, you know, not really because it happens subconsciously. And uh, that's it. Those are the different ways that I can think of that you can leverage the uh, bandwagon effect within our half hour time frame. So to go over them again real quick, showing off the crowd, letting people see the line around the building, in other words, figuratively. Uh, or literally, if you have a brick and mortar store, um, exponential buzz is, uh, you want to make sure that you talk about the rate at which the crowd is growing. Um, there's the wall of testimonials that you can use. Um, there are, uh, pre-orders and different methods you can use to build up a crowd before you launch. So you can have bandwagon effect from the beginning of the public launch. And then finally, uh, things like affiliate leaderboards will help you leverage and grow your list of people who are willing to promote your products for you, all using the bandwagon effect. 
Um, that's it for this week. Um, I'm going to let Zane see if we have any more questions while I do my little closing spiel. Um, once again, if you like the show, you can find 27 previous episodes on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash cult of copy. Um, our website is cult of copy.com. We have a group on Facebook also called the cult of copy. If you want to come in and discuss this kind of things, uh, with me and my nerdy friends, all 15,000 of them, um, you are more than welcome to. We would love to have you. Uh, if you join us next week, live uh, Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to do another episode, and we are going to be talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is the idea that um, people who are inexperienced or unskilled or unintelligent will almost always overestimate their abilities because they don't have enough information to know that they're wrong about it, basically. Um, this ties into a lot of other psychological effects, but I think it's going to be a good episode because you can use this effect against people to help them leap to conclusions that are maybe not necessarily true, but because they don't know better, but they think they do, you can get people to do uh, incredible things by messing with their heads. So I hope you will join us next week for that episode, The Dunning-Kruger Effect. Um, and that is it for this week's episode of The Cult of Copy Show. I have been your host, the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin D. Terrio, Pontifex Maximus of The Cult of Copy. Zane Miller is our director in his director booth looking for questions. Do we have any final questions, Zane? Uh, nope, that was it. I guess you just had them all entranced. Awesome. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for stopping by, and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Happy Friday the 13th. Bye-bye. Yeah.